Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is your brother Asar M. Hotep with the Madhu Indela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. And we are here Tuesday, July the 14th, 2020. Um, it is an earlier show than what we normally do, but that's because uh, our guest, our special guest for this morning, is uh, across the seas for us. And I guess we would be across the seas uh, for him. And so, you know, this is a, a another London edition um, or UK uh, Britain edition, if we should say, um, of the program. And, you know, I am honored to have uh, our brother Robin Walker as a guest this morning. And so... This is an individual who I've uh, known and interacted with for um, a, a good many number of years, but it's all been uh, online. And so uh, I have yet to physically meet our good brother. Um, but uh, so this, in essence, kind of is a, a, a reintroduction, you know, saying to to both of us. And so. Um, he has written many, many powerful works and it is an engaged critically in the, the history and knowledge of African people, you know, worldwide. And um, it is an, an honor to have him on the program. And so um, before I bring him on, as always, I like to acknowledge you know, those who are listening to the program live, both on Facebook and on YouTube. And of course, those who are going to be listening when the show is archived after the live stream. So I like to thank all of you, you know, for, for listening and watching. And if you are new to my program, please hit the subscribe button and make sure that you hit the bell when you subscribe so that when I bring on uh, guests such as Robin Walker, et cetera, that you will get the notifications, you know, in your, your inbox or on your app, if you have the YouTube app, you know, on your phone. So, um, a shout out to those who have made themselves known in the chat room who are currently listening. Uh, peace to Brian Hess, peace to Johnny B, Emmanuel Adama, Philly Chu215, Ernest Godfrey, Sister Tamika, I am Pablo, and thank you, Brother uh, Bontum, for uh, your, your contribution, and uh, welcome to the program, uh, and Texas is in the building. Uh, peace to Pamela Moore, OG Gorilla, what's good? Uh, Prisoners of War, uh, Sarah Jahuti, Brother Chavez, Texas in the House again, 
uh, academics or I'm a medics. I'm sorry. Um, and Enigma nine by nine and a moon men Ra suit Atom, and all of those who are listening, of course, via uh, Facebook. I see brother Ifa Tunde, AKA brother son Jetty in the building. So Philly in the house and I guess Jersey in the house you know, uh, due to the move, but Simeon, uh, the atheist killer, uh, peace and blessings to you in the building and the God King Darrell, peace, 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 Jagad Davis, George Asar Jean, peace, peace to you. Uh, much love to everyone who is listening on the program. And so, uh, I have a quick announcement and that is July the 18th is when the Hoppy film um, premieres to the public. And that's going to be a Saturday and it's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And so uh, you should know that it is a one time showing. So it's not that it's made available for everyone to to watch the film. So, you know, go to hoppyfilms.com and purchase your ticket for your household. And uh, make sure that you are at your computer or smart TV, however it is uh, that you uh, watch things on the net. And, you know, you're, you're there for the, the premiere. And so they will premiere it again probably in another two weeks or so, but just to let you know that when you purchase your ticket, it is is as like if you were going to the movies. You you have to have your behind in the seat uh, to watch the movie live. Otherwise, you miss uh, the movie. So uh, make sure that you uh, are reminded, or make sure that you keep that in mind. So to uh, view the film, go to hoppyfilm.com and you know, I know that you will enjoy the film. And so without further ado, um, I am going to introduce our guest and bring him out of the green room. And so peace and blessings, Brother Robin Walker. How are you doing, sir? Having a good day so far. So it's been really, really good. Pleased to be on your show and yeah, hope it's, um, hope it's productive. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. And um, peace to Shaka Ra. Yes, London is in the house. Philly is in the house. Jersey is in the house. And thank you, um, Philly Chu215, uh, for your uh, contribution to the program. Um, so uh, with that, with that said, uh, again, welcome to the program. It is an honor to to have you here. We have a lot to cover, and there's a lot of people that you know love to hear from you. And so, you know, first and foremost, if you can just give us a little bit of background of, of yourself, you know, where are you from, um, and you know, what was your educational journey to get you to the place where you're at now in terms of your your principal concern. Uh, as a historian. Okay, well, my name's Robin Walker. I'm known as the Black History Man, but what I do for a living isn't just Black History. Um, I work in the field of Black Studies, the same thing that the African Americans call Africana Studies. Mm -hmm. um, in Britain, until very recently, there's no institutions that you can teach that subject in. So following in the footsteps of my tutor, we do it outside the system. We do it in community centers, that kind of thing. And we engage regular adults with the, the Black Studies thing. So what I do then is I'm an educator, I'm a business person, and my job is very, very much to present uh, Black history and heritage in bite-sized chunks so that it's accessible to as many people as I can make it accessible. Um, how I got into this was um, many, many years ago, I came across Chancellor Williams's book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. And it's fair to say that that book changed my life. Hmm. 
All righty. You, you All right. mentioned one of your um, mentors. Now, um, I, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the uh, professor, Dr. Kamani Nahusi, sure. uh, you know, who was relatively recently teaching out in um, the UK. And he's now here in the United States actually teaching in Philly. And so I told him that, you know, we was having a phone conversation and um, I told him that I was going to have you on the program. And he told me to mention the name Femi Biko. And 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 so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, who is this person and how influential was he, you know, in this kind of um, what we call in, in the States, the Independent African Academy? um you know in 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 london um in 1990 i began studying with uh, fem biko uh what he did was to uh, make the ideas of maulana karenga the introduction to black studies make mm -hmm. those ideas accessible to a black british audience and he was teaching this in london he was doing it in community centers um and i was one of his students and he saw some potential in me and asked me if I could teach one of his courses. And so he gave me his notes, his lecture notes. And then based on his lecture notes and based on his reading list, uh, I began to teach two of the modules in his course. I began to teach the history module and the religion module. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I began to teach a bit more the sociology module, the psychology module, until eventually I could teach the, the whole program. So Femi Biko is very, very um, influential. Uh, and so a lot of people who are kind of my age in London, interested in the, the Black Studies thing, chances are we got it from him. Hmm. Indeed, indeed. Um, and, and Dr. Nahusi um, says hello. Uh, and um, oh, by the way, let me tell you where he fits in. Okay, um, go ahead. Again, when I began teaching black history, one area that I couldn't teach was the slave trade. So mm. I actually asked uh, uh, Dr. Nehusi to teach that for me. And then I took notes. And so the way I teach the slave trade is actually based on how Dr. Kimani um, taught it. So in other words, my notes are coming from him on that mm. subject. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, he's a very dynamic brother, and we've had him uh, on this program as well uh, fairly recently. Um, and so, you know, needless to say, there's a there's a network of of, of scholars and and interactions that are that are going on there, and and some of that has kind of spilled over here into the United States. Now, when I came across you, this was back in the day when the Yahoo groups listserv was a major medium in which, you know, scholars and laypersons could could interact and um, have conversations on a variety of things. And so, you know, there there was two major ones. There was there was your Yahoo group list. African uh, classical history. African classical history. And then there was the one created by uh, Dr. Paul, and that was the Tassetti, you know, African um, historical uh, list. And that one was primarily dealing with ancient Egypt, but yours was a little bit more broad uh, in, in scope, uh, dealing with, you know, just African uh, history and things in general. So it is around that time, this is in the early or mid 2000s, that I came across and we've had interactions and uh, debates about certain things uh, or whatnot. And um, and so, you know, we, we can see, you know, like, you know, what y'all were doing there had begun to become global um, via, you know, this particular technology. And so, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about the, the creation of the group. You know, what was your in, uh, motivation and intent and how has that, you know, kind of shaped and or, or, you know, who are some people that you, you know, became acquainted with as a result 
of those early, you know, Yahoo group interactions? Yeah, I mean, the Yahoo, that was some back-in-the-day stuff, wasn't it? <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, the idea was, was to set up a, a chat room. People could join it. Uh, for young heads here, that's the way it was done before um, mm. Facebook and all that stuff. Um, and what I wanted to do was to create a forum where people could chat African history, uh, ancient African history, medieval African history, anything to do with Africa so that there could be a, a place where these kinds of issues were being discussed. I wanted to do something that was a bit broader than what I call the Van Sertima School of African History, which is important, but it's mostly African history outside Africa. I want to talk about African history inside Africa as well. Um, so we had obviously yourself coming on, uh, 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 kicking some knowledge. We had um Clyde Ahmad Winters kicking some knowledge we had uh, uh, Femi uh, uh, Fari Sapir we had Benebi Benatari um so different people came on and it was it has to be said some good knowledge um got uh, got this got chopped up um during that period I mean some good research uh, also if there was a new story that came out archaeologists had dug something up. Someone would post it onto the site. Um, and some people like Onyakachi Wambu still do that. So yeah, it, it was good. It was good. And then, of course, you had the Tarseti posse with, I think it was Paul Kekai Mans Mansala, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that was more of a, an ancient Egypt forum. But again, good knowledge um, 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 got chopped up during that too. So yeah, I, I look back fondly at the um, in the African classical and Tarsetti uh, dates. Yeah, it's unfortunate yeah. that the yeah. that the groups no longer exist, and that you can't go um, back and and check the archives. I think uh, you can actually. I think you can, but it's it's just difficult to do because of the way. It, it, I mean, yeah, you can. I, I tried recently. And I think they've gotten rid of, you know, all the Yahoo groups. And so they before you could just probably like less than a year ago. Okay. And you can you can just kind of see the archives because, you know, you could upload images. And so people would discuss, you know, images and they would have links to, you know, actual, you know, primary studies and, and things of that nature. So it was a real good um, interchange. Of, of source material, you know, for people who wanted to go in depth, you know, on these various aspects of African history. And so, as you said, like this was, this was social media before social media was a, a buzz term. And so it was, it was the Yahoo groups list. And, um, and so, you know, people like, you know, Professor Manu and Pim, you know, would, would, would be on there and, you know, they even even some other European scholars um, who, you know, were in opposition to certain things. You know, it was it wasn't all one sided. You know, there yeah. was there was conflict and interchange of, of, of ideas. That's one of the things. Do you remember her? Who? Catherine Griffiths Greenberg. Yes. Yes. So she was a, a, a person working on her doctorate in Egyptology, I think, at the time. And so, you know, it was it was an exchange. So it was it was some big names, you know, and 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 people that were uh, uh, serious about it um, and, and had a critical eye, you know, for this for this subject. So, you know, with that said, you know, moving um, forward a little bit and I'm not sure if this is your your first book. Um, but if not, you know, you're you're more known um, around the world for this uh, amazing text titled When We Ruled. And if that is not your first book, can you give us your 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 first text and then, you know, what led up to When We Ruled? As a Black Studies teacher, um, teaching Femi Biko's courses, uh, he had a very, very long reading list. And because I'm quite used to reading lots of different books, that was kind of easy for me to do. 
But for the students coming on the course, the idea that they'd have to read at least seven books just to get the core of the history, and then X amount of books to get the core for the religion, and then X amount of books to get the core for the other subjects. That was tough going. So what I did was I had the idea of putting the lecture notes together and turning into one book that could then introduce everything else. So in 1999, I did my first book. It was called Classical Splendor, Roots of Black History. Mm -hmm. um, it was about 160 pages, something like that. Um, and it deals with the same things that When We Ruled deals with. Okay. But it was 160 pages. A lot of people didn't take it seriously, didn't take it remotely seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my thing was, um, uh, instead of introducing, let me s just spill out everything I know. And then spilling out everything I, I knew, the result was a 700 page or something like that book. And because it was 700 pages, because it first came out in full color, a uh, hard cover, wrap around jacket, inside boards, um, people had to take it seriously. Uh, in other words, a lot of money got spent on that book. And so when we ruled is really the fattened up version of classical splendor, roots of black history. And the difference is, is one is introducing the material using the course notes that I used to teach black studies from. And the second one is, if you like, me spilling out everything I know. And, you know, that's about as much as I know. So that was the whole point of when we ruled. All right. And, and one of the, the, I think you're in your second um, edition. I still have the first edition, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So I have to get the second edition. Um, and, well, what's the difference between the two editions. I assume you added some more information or expanded it in certain parts, but what fundamentally is the difference between this, uh, the first and second edition of When We Rule? Not an awful lot, to be honest, but there is a difference. But, you know, I always tell people, if you've got the first edition, you've got it. All right, the second edition, the there's a chapter on black women's history where women are looked at as the centerpiece, and I'm telling the sweep of black history through the position of women. Uh, that chapter was rewritten. Mm -hmm. The enslavement chapter and the resistance to enslavement, uh, that was rewritten to include a lot, lot more detail of the resistance to enslavement. Mm -hmm. The other difference is the, the second edition has got something like 150 more pictures so that all the images that appear in the Van Sertima books we're showing that the you know portraits of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs are portraits of people from the Indus Valley, that kind of thing. As many of those images as I could get my hands on. So the idea would be it would be very, very comprehensive in terms of imagery so that you don't have to go anywhere else for the imagery. So mm -hmm. it, two chapters have been rewritten and then the, the imagery meaning that we could you could go go down the line, you know, Pharaoh of the first dynasty, turn over the page, Pharaoh of the second dynasty, turn over the page, Pharaoh from the third dynasty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, m making that as comprehensive as possible. Indeed, indeed. Now, you know, one of the major things about that text, uh, uh, of course, you're, you're dealing with a long time span of history in those 700 plus pages. And, you know, one of the, the things that you tackled was the chronology of ancient Egypt. And, you know, you bring to note this notion of the long chronology versus the short chronology. And so I want you to kind of talk about that and, and, you know, what were the details that made you go with the this the notion of the long chronology versus you know and, and the controversies in terms of the dating what did you discover as a result of your research generally speaking are uh, most of the textbooks most of the internet sites uh have this idea that the very first king of ancient egypt was ruled somewhere between 3200 bc 
and 3000 BC. They named that king as Menes or Namer or Mena, same person. Mm -hmm. But they put him just before 3000 BC. Um, now, having studied under Dr. Femi Biko, he taught me years ago that that was nonsense. And that's got nothing to do with Egyptian record. And he pointed me to the research of Professor John Jackson, the scholar who wrote um, Man, God and Civilization and Introduction to African Civilizations. And he championed a Scottish chronologist called Duncan McNaughton. So I bought Duncan McNaughton's book and cleaned it out. Mm -hmm. Another source that I used was um, the great uh, Dr. Yusuf ben Yochanan did a book called Black Man of the Nile. And he too is coming with the long, long chronology. He had come across a book uh, by a scholar called Hekakian Bey. And Hekakian Bey is also coming with the, 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 the chronology. So what I did was I had to work out the scholars that are claiming that ancient Egypt begins 3200 BC, 3100 BC, 3000 BC. What's their evidence? And then I found out that they didn't have any. Basically, they were making it up. And how they were able to make it up is there are two dates that are relevant to the Egyptian story. Two dates. Uh, there's a pharaoh from the 12th ruling dynasty. And the pharaoh from the 12th ruling dynasty is Sinosret III. And then there's a, a pharaoh from the 18th ruling dynasty. And that's Amenhotep I. And both of these are pharaohs. There's a document that survived from their time period that's astronomically dated. And the astronomical date means you can compare it to the Sothic star. And whenever that Sothic star rose, uh, what they call it, Haliakali, the same time as the sun rises, that could fix the date astronomically. Now, here's the thing what scholars were doing is removing a whole Sothic cycle from one date to the other. So what happens is, is that if you look at Egyptian records, they put the two pharaohs, the pharaoh from the 12th dynasty and the pharaoh from the 18th dynasty, they put them more than 1,400 years apart. Now, what happened, what the, uh, the, the short chronologists were doing is they were removing the whole Sothic cycle removing the 1,400 years and then closing up the timeline. And then by closing up the timeline, you could make it look like there was only a few hundred years gap from the 12th to the 18th dynasties. Hmm. Now, the problem with that is dynasty 13, dynasty 14, dynasty 15, dynasty 16, and dynasty 17 now had to fit in to 208 years. And that's not possible. You can't fit that amount of time into 208 years. So the way that the Egyptologists deal with it is they don't show the dynasty 13 kings list. They don't show the king, dynasty 14 kings list because anyone can see the list, realize that that's, there's no way that that can fit into 208. There's simply too many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you take, for example, dynasty 13, uh, as you may know, there's two versions of the Manetho kings list. There's Africanity's version, and there's Bishop Eusebius's version. Both of these versions say that Dynasty 13 reigned 453 years. You can't fit 453 years into a 208 year time gap. That can't be done. Mm -hmm. so how the scholars deal with it then is they present what they call selections of kings. So instead of showing that the full Dynasty 13 list, just show a selection. So you can make it look like Dynasty 13 only had three or four kings. You can then do the same mm. thing with Dynasty 14, do the same thing with Dynasty 15. And when I realized that, I realized these guys are engaging in fraud. But mm. what it is, is because a lot of our scholars hadn't really done that kind of work. So big up to John Jackson, big up to Yusuf Ben Yochanan, uh, big up to Rashidi for giving it a go. But what they you know, what none of these people did was to reproduce the names of the list. And that's that's what I did. And then realized that the short chronology is, is impossible. Not it's wrong. It's impossible. Hmm. And so when you then 
put the Sothic, Sothiac cycle, the 1,460 years cycle back in, and then separate the, the, the one side, the, the 18th dynasty, and the other side, the 12th dynasty, then the long chronology stands up. Now, there are problems with the long chronology, uh, no doubt. It doesn't fit harmoniously with the, the, the carbon dating. You know that the uh, 16 Old Kingdom monuments have been uh, uh, redated. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't fit harmoniously with that. Um, so I'm quite prepared to you know, put my hand up and say, yeah, there, there's, there's problems with it. But compared to the short chronology, the short chronology is quite simply nonsense. Mm -hmm. um have you uh come across a text called um the ancient egyptian chronology which is uh edited by eric hornung and rolf uh kraus um published by brill i haven't come across the book but i have used eric hornung's chronology Mm -hmm. um, and Eric Hornung's book, you know, he did a book called History of Ancient Egypt. That was mm -hmm. one of my source books in reconstruction. But um, I can tell you now, if the, the chronology, if he's using the same chronology that's in his book, that's that's mm -hmm. nonsense too. I mean, no disrespect, but it is what it is. No, I would like to. Well, he he's not the principal author. You know, he's just one of three uh, uh, editors, and so the the third editor's name uh, David. Uh, Warburton and um, and so they have a text it was also published in 2006 on the Egyptian chronology and so of course they reduce it to about like 3,000 but what's what's unique about this text is that it has a, a variety of different authors who are attacking the problem from you know different angles whether we're talking about the the chronology or astronomical and da 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 so each chapter is written by a different author and then you know the the editors kind of summarize and come to their conclusion in at the end of the text and so i just uh would would like to you know get your your take you know on um that in the future given the long chronology uh, hey, let, me, let me make some obvious points though. The, okay. the short chronology um, isn't a new thing. People claiming that ancient Egypt goes back to 3000 BC, that's not new. That argument had all, you know, was people were already faking the funk in the 19th mm -hmm. century. And yeah. so I, I, I'd be amazed to find what a 2006 book would be saying that's new. That wasn't had, hadn't already been fact because the, the short chronology the real person that started that was edward meyer and mm -hmm. edward meyer had, had, had already faked that in the 19th century exactly what what i can do is um i'll send you a copy of the text and then you just have it for your records and you can read but one of the things i found problematic about you know at least one of the chapters is that they were trying to and, and this is kind of subtle and you just kind of have have to have a critical eye to really kind of make this connection is that they were trying to of course which you already know sync it with what they understand what was going on in like israel and mesopotamia and so the assumption is that the dates that they're trying to calibrate with ancient egypt that they're dating for what's going on in Palestine and in Mesopotamia are right and exact. And that is only the Egyptian stuff that is, is questionable. And so everything that they're trying to deal with in terms of the Egyptian side, now they're trying to, to match it up with the Mesopotamia instead of it being, you know, done independently on its own in terms of the, the evidence of the society is on its own instead of trying to to match it up with uh you know what is going on in in mesopotamia and things so i found that a methodological you know uh issue uh but it, 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 let me just jump in here's the other problem too um the same duncan mcnaughton the same book that um, i i'd come across uh, uh in uh john jackson was the one that put that one forward yeah. The same Duncan McNaughton has written a book called A Scheme of Babylonian Chronology, 1929. Mm -hmm. And when he, he also deals with the issues of synchronisms between Mesopotamia and Egypt. And so 
here you have a scholar that is defending the long chronology and he's aware of the, the synchronicities. So the idea of synchronisms between Mesopotamia and Egypt, they, they do exist. They're just not where the short chronologists want them to be because they want Mesopotamia to be older and it, that simply can't be done. So what I would recommend, anyone watching this, if you can get your hands on a scheme of Babylonian chronology by Duncan McNaughton, a scheme of Egyptian chronology by Duncan McNaughton, and compare that with what the short chronologists are saying, and you can then see the fakery uh, for yourself. Let me say one more thing as well about the Mesopotamia thing, because this is why I stand on my square when it comes to the long chronology. <laughs> with Mesopotamia, there's a document called the Sumerian King List. And why scholars think the Sumerian King List is, is, is correct, why people run with it, is because there's a king on the list called Enmebaragesi. That's his name, Enmebaragesi. And before he was found, it was thought the king's list could have been mythological. Then they found Enmebaragesi. What they found was a vase with the name Mebaragzi on the vase. And then they think Mebaragzi, that's the original name, Enmebaragesi, that's it being written up on the Sumerian king's list. So let's analyze that. They found one king on a Sumerian king's list, the early period, and then that validates the Sumerian king's list. Yeah? Okay, now let's use that standard for ancient Egypt. How many pieces of evidence do, do we have that Pharaoh Narmer stroke Mena exists? Well, there's a portrait of him. There's the Narmer's tablet. There's the mace head. Do you see? How many pieces of evidence that we have that Pharaoh Den exists? There's a wooden uh, a tab tablet with him doing the ritual run on it. How many pieces of evidence that we have that the other kings of the first dynasty exist? Their tombs have been found. The kings of the second dynasty, their tombs have been found. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the third dynasty, Sarneket, there's a portrait of him. Zosa, there's, a por there's portraits of him. Then you've got the step pyramid, do you see? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the pharaohs then of the first and second dynasties, either we have a name somewhere or we have a portrait or we have a tomb or we have a monument. Do you see? Mm -hmm. and if that proves that they exist, then that would then validate the timeline in the same way that Enmebaragesi or Mebaragzi validates the Sumerian king's list. So what's happening is, is that people are acting like there's no evidence that these ancient Egyptian rulers existed when sometimes we've got a portrait, sometimes we've got a name, sometimes we've got an inscription, sometimes we've got their mace, sometimes we've got their tomb. Whereas with the Sumerian kings, all we've got is one person's vase, do you see? <laughs> Yet one person's vase validates it for the Sumerians. Hmm. Yeah. And so when I realize that, that's why I, I stand on my square when it comes to the long chronology. Indeed. Now, you know, speaking of the Sumerians, you know, when we ruled the the final chapter uh, deals with the possibility that the the Sumerian language is related to the Proto-Bantu language or the Bantu language and people, which if we use the mainstream identification of the language families, it would make it a, a Niger-Congo language. Well, I should say the Greenbergian uh, model in terms of classification of African languages, it would make it a, a, a Niger-Congo language. And um, we recently had, and thanks to you for the contact, um, Brother Hermel Hermstein, you know, on the, the program who uh, has kind of continued the work. And I should say that the, the person who wrote the last chapter was Fari Sapai, uh, Sapara. And, um, and, you know, taking these two uh, individuals and, and their analysis of the language of Sumerian, you know, with uh, African languages. What is your take on on ancient Sumer and its potential Africanness, and, and what was kind of going on 
in in your opinion uh as far as that particular civilization is concerned yeah um black people should claim it <laughs> yeah. um so I'm, I'm clear about that so in other words i don't just go after ancient egypt uh, i'm going after Sumer. i'm going after elam i'm going after the dravidians all of that is black history and we should claim it hmm. okay now the the the, the research of fari and the, the pomegranate publishing stuff the you know um, black suma all brilliant research um i think the black suma uh, books is some of the best research that you know a black scholar putting pen to paper has ever produced a uh, hmm. monster 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 scholarship all right so basically with the sumerians you've got um uh, Sumerian kings ruling uh, based on the McNaughton chronology around 3300 BC to about 2609 BC. Ibisin is the last Sumerian king before he's overthrown, 2609 BC. And then that's where the Gutians, who are thought to be Caucasians, flood into the Iraq region and overthrow what the original black population had. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's black history and heritage right there. And, you know, black people should know and, and claim and claim that heritage. And then, of course, you've got next door to Suma, you've got Elam, which is where Iran is today. And there's a black history there. The Elamites were, if you like, a, a, a rival civilization to the Sumerians. Um, but they, they both wrote in cuneiform. They both wrote, both built ziggurats. And again, that is history that, again, the black community should claim. Indeed, indeed. And I've, I've expanded uh, on their work, uh, but not being limited to the hypothesis given by Greenberg. And so we can, the, the same kind of correspondences that we could see with Bantu and um, uh, Sumerian, we can find with ancient Egyptian and Sumerian. And which would make sense since we could do the same thing between Bantu and ancient Egyptian. And so, you know, where I differ with um, like Hermstein in terms of the, the path in which these particular um, Africans took to get into that area. So like there's a, even a, re uh, a previous scholar to uh, Hermstein and, and, and Fari, and that is uh, G, Dr. G.J.K. Campbell Dunn. Now, he argues that because he has a book that was released in 2009, um, two books, actually, uh, Sumerian Grammar and Sumerian Dictionary. And he's doing some comparisons. It's mainly mass comparison, but with, with Niger Congo. So he's looking at Niger Congo as a whole and Sumerian. So he deals with it on a grammatical uh, level and that's one book and then the the comparative dictionary on the other and so you know his argument is that they came out of like congo and and went up like probably possibly through like yemen on up and i think it's almost similar to hermstein but he's talking about chad you know uh going you know east through sudan and either crossing over the river but it is my argument that they that they came straight they're a remnant of a group of africans who came out of the nile valley with some settling in what we call um palestine and you know the levant in that area and others moving further uh north into or you know kind of north east you know, or whatnot into uh mesopotamia and uh, Sumerians. So the Sumerians, in my eyes, are the last of the remnants of this particular African group or, or series of Africans, you know, who, who came and landed in their space. Now, what I argue is that that the, there were already people. We, we, we have genetic and we have archaeological evidence that there's been people existing in these areas since the out of Africa, you know, movement. And um, but some of these people, you know, are folks who migrated out of, back migrated out of India, but who have already gone through their mutations in terms of uh, skin color 
and settled in what we call the Middle East. And that the that this was a later wave of Africans who came and settled and influenced and helped to create um, through a convergence process of you know the Semitic languages and then Sumerian being that last remnant of African languages that were just, they were able to keep their identity and things before, as you mentioned earlier, being overwhelmed by the, the Europeans and then later the, um, the, the Semites, you know, saying who came and took over that area. And so it's a very complex history that we have to be, you know, very detailed and, and, and kind of piecing together and showing these migrations. Uh, from these different areas. So what, what would be good is a good study on the climatology, you know, like what is motivating these Europeans to come out of Europe at this time to settle, you know, into the, to, in the, in the quote unquote Middle East. And then how does that change the dynamic in terms of power relations, in terms of language and culture and things that would, that would be, you know, for someone who's interested, that would be a good research project. Uh, let me jump in there as well. Um, it's also um, an application of Chancellor Williams's The Destruction of Black Civilization. Mm -hmm. Chancellor Williams had the idea that the destruction of black civilization started with infiltrations of ancient Egypt. Um, I teach that the, the, the destruction of black civilization, uh, the first black civilization to be overthrown were the Sumerians. So the, as far as I'm concerned, the story didn't start in, in Africa. The story started in the Middle East. And then once the Middle East was taken, the next place would then be Dravidian, India. Mm. And then once that was taken, then we start getting the overthrow of different places in Africa. Do you see? Indeed. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Um, Okay, so somebody, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to monitor comments on both uh, platforms uh, here. Somebody's posting about police brutality, a relevant topic, but not necessarily what we're covering at the moment. So, uh, but yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a vast history that, um, that needs attention. So the question being, you know, because, uh, you know, we're always accused of, and, and this will kind of lead into some of your other books, which we'll mention. But why should we be even concerned with history? Like, you know, we're talking 3000, 4000 BCE, 2600 BCE, et cetera, et cetera. What does that have to do with us in, in the modern times? And, and why should we value this information? Yeah, let, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we do today was established back then. A lot of the rituals that we have today, a lot of the beliefs that we have today, a lot of these things were established then. So history is always relevant. It's always a current event. But what it is, is because black people, have, the way mainstream historians present it, we don't exist in, in ancient history, possibly in the empire of Kush. And outside of Kush, we don't exist. And so um, the relevance of ancient history to, to, to the modern world, most people can't see it because it's not presented that way. So my job as an educator and as a business person is to make that those links accessible. So just to um, give some examples, if you look at some of the religious ideas that some of the ancient civilizations have, they've had a big impact on later religions that we have today some of the mathematical ideas that some of the ancient uh, civilizations had, some of the mathematical um, papyri that they had, has a relevance today. Some of the medical ideas that the ancient world had has a, a, a relevance today. Some of the artistic, architectural, um, and aesthetic ideas that the ancient world has. So my thing is to make all of that accessible so that people really can see that some of what went at what some of what went down five thousand six thousand seven thousand is still years ago is still relevant to today because it has an impact today the only thing is is the way mainstream history has been written has been to remove black people from that discussion and they've done a very good job so i'm part of that rebellion you are you know <laughs> this is what we do 
Indeed. I'm, I'm going to take a, a quick question before we move on. Um, and so this is coming from Emmanuel. Um, if you could read the question, do you know if there is any relation between the ancient population of Mesopotamia and the Hemurites? Um, no, I don't know of any uh, uh, connection. Basically, Mesopotamia is where Iraq and the southern part of Syria is today. The Himyarites were the original, some people say, black inhabitants of southern Arabia. And is there a connection? All right, now, the Sumerians used to have texts where they spoke about two ancestral lands to them. One ancestral land was Magan, and the other ancestral land was Melucha. Mm -hmm. um, everyone is agreed that Melucha means land of the blacks, but they're not sure which one that is. Mm -hmm. uh, the general feeling, uh, certainly uh, Assyriologist Samuel Noah Kramer says Magan is Egypt. So mm -hmm. some people used to say that Melucha is Kush and Magan is Egypt. Some people say Melucha includes Yemen as well. Mm. And, um, so they, they stretch the definition of Melucha to include Yemen. And if that's true, then the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, saw Melucha as, if you like, some kind of ancestral land, that there's a belief that that's where some of their ancestors could have come from. Um, outside of this uh, Sumerian belief about Magan and Melucha, um, I don't know of any direct links from the time period that's not a tradition, you see? But it might be a link, but I don't know what it is. Hmm. Um, thank you, Mr. Trey Day 90 for your contribution and your uh, comment. And you have a question is, why is the diffusion model of the people the peopling of Kemet so ran from by the West. I'm not sure. I think I know what he's trying to say. I think I know what he's trying to say. Yeah, why is it that the idea that from ancient Egypt, the rest of Africa got populated, if you like. So some of the people in, the, in, in outside Egypt are descended from the ancient Egyptians. I think that's the question he's trying to ask. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard to see why people would run from that. Um, because what that would mean is some of the peoples in North Africa to the west of Egypt, some of the people in West Africa, southwest of Egypt, some of the people uh, in the Sudan and Uganda regions, um, some of the people even to the, you know, the Horn of Africa uh, may well be descended from the ancient Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And that theory, of descent from ancient Egypt uh, upsets a lot of people because that would mean that you'd have to give regular black people a lot more respect than, <laughs> than you would want to. My, my theory, though, is a little bit different. Um, I question West African descent from ancient Egypt. I know people are going to want to shoot me, but I question it. And my thing is, if people... Uh, West Africans are partly descended from the ancient Egyptians, then languages like Coptic would have been spoken by people fleeing ancient Egypt during you know, the, the Greco-Roman and Arabic periods. I don't really see too much. Of, I, in other words, I've got documentary evidence of people fleeing from Egypt to Sudan, Egypt to Ethiopia, but I don't see too much of Egypt to West Africa. I know people want to shoot me on that because a lot of people, that's the thing. And I'm on and, and another subject, as I saw your thing where you present the um, uh, 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 an image from Yoruba land, mm -hmm. um, a person with a death mask around their neck and something that's almost identical, a best image where there's a death mask. I have to be said, that was that was genius. That was genius. <laughs> uh, respect, you know, big respect. But for me, um, I'd want to see more linguistic connections to seal it between Egypt and West Africa. In other words, Egypt and, and, and Sudan, no problem. Egypt and Ethiopia, no problem. See, the, the hard thing about that, see, this is my argument. 
Like for anybody arguing, I think the first person to put that the the argument, the diffusion argument that you mentioned was Dr. Lilius Holmberger, mm -hmm. um, who was a linguist, you know, in the early 1900s, was Shekhan Diop's first linguistic teacher um, in Europe. And, you know, her text, matter of fact, I have her text, uh, at least her, her English text. Um, what is this? She writes in French primarily. So this is translated into English. Uh, it doesn't have a cover. Well, mm -hmm. it had a cover, but it's, of course, this book is old and tore up. Um, purchased it from a library liquidation. So if y'all looking for books, look for libraries and see if they're liquidating any books. You'll, you'll find some jewels uh, there. But the, the Negro African Languages, mm -hmm. so this was uh, published in 1949. So she's making the argument in here that the Fulani, the Mande, the Bantu speaking people, uh, Bombara, etc., that they all come from ancient Egypt, and this is her linguistic analysis. Now, her her overall conclusion, you know, has been dismissed by a lot of um, researchers. But what they never do is engage her reason for the argument, which are actually sound linguists. She's a she's a bona fide linguist, and she's saying that you know the relationship between these. Um, languages, you know, indicate, uh, excuse me, the, in terms of these West African and Central African languages, that the, the, the kinds of relationship that is with ancient Egypt, it is not by accident. Like there's a, a bona fide, genuine relationship. Her thing is that, you know, that they must have come from ancient Egypt. Now, check out the being her student adopts the notion that there's a relationship but he doesn't make the argument that they come from you know uh, um Af i mean from egypt itself that they're um brother and sister relationships in terms of belonging to a a central uh family and so later on theophilo binga takes up that that notion and demonstrates and he proposes his negro egyptian language family so there's a lineage in terms of perspectives there. Now, when it comes to the the arguments of relationships, what I present is more so that there's a genuine relationship that can be traced to the proto-language and proto-culture of the ancient Egyptians and many of the West African and Central African groups. However, you know, from that, you know, they from the central core language family and, and cultural group, they spread out and became different people, you know, over time. However, there are groups of ancient Egyptians who um, migrated out due for different reasons, for war, for droughts and things in, in units of like families of small villages, et cetera, in these different pockets who settled among and in some instances integrated with those those peoples in different pockets you know going down into kenya uganda etc like in the case of the collagen people um you you have documentary evidence from the early 1900s of the oral tradition of these six migratory waves of ancient egyptians coming out of you know going over north africa and settling um in 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 senegal um and, and so this was published in French in like 1911 uh, or whatnot. So it was an individual, uh, Yaro Jiao, who was commissioned to write the history because this was the oral tradition in his society. So there's no Egyptology in Senegal at this time. There's no reason for them to, you know, um, dream up this, this grand scheme of, of ancient Egypt uh, or origins in ancient Egypt. So this is a purely cultural, you know, documentation, you know, that, that goes on in these texts. And so when, when I'm looking at the stories, you're seeing that there's certain families who are coming and settling amongst, you know, saying the groups. So in this instance, I wouldn't be looking for per se, like a modern version of 
Coptic or Middle Egyptian or whatnot. Yeah. I'm looking for loan words for, yeah. you know, um, processes and technologies and things of that nature. So, for example, you find a lot of metallurgical loan words in the Wolof language. And it fits with their first migratory, because uh, again, it was a six way. So the first one talks about how all the metallurgists came and settled ultimately um, in, in, in what we now call Senegal. And so, you know, if, if, if there's a gang of metallurgists, I need to look at the technology, the terms for technology dealing with metallurgy and to see if it matches with the ancient Egyptian, because this would be something that would not diffuse down even in the related from the proto language going yeah. back so far because metallurgy is not that old in comparison to you know what we would think of in terms of the relations of the proto language that gave birth to both Wolof and um ancient egyptian and so question, it's question, question. um dr finch has written a book called um the star of our deep beginnings yeah and he mentions a 2800 BC toolkit in Senegal. Hmm. 2800 BC, how would that fit with what you're coming with? Um, if it, I don't think it's dealing with metallurgy per se. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to review it to know but exactly what he's talking about our copper tools, you see. Again, I would have to review exactly because it's been a minute. And, and keep in mind that, you know, I live in Philadelphia, uh, yeah. PA, which is on the east coast of the United States. And so currently I'm in Texas, which is, yeah. you know, in uh, central uh, part of the U.S. So my books are all in in Philly right now. So I will have to um, review that particular section. But, you know, again, it's it's, you know, when it comes to certain metallurgy, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, terms. So it, it's not like, you, you know, we would have to account for and, and maybe argue, you know, that is coincidence that yeah, yeah. the let's let's just assume that what you're saying is 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 true off the bat, that it's a coincidence that they would call these technologies and the end product the same thing as the ancient Egyptians. Now it's mm -hmm. also possible, and and this is something that I that I introduce as well that given the long distance trade that the ancient Egyptians had with uh, Central and East Africa, um, it's also possible that, you know, word got around of this location where, you know, people can do business and trade and all this other kind of stuff and it attracted folks from different parts of, of Africa ultimately, um, you know, to ancient Egypt. So I don't assume that the flow of knowledge and concepts come from ancient Egypt to West Africa. It could be possible that, you know, those who settled in West Africa migrate. And, and we keep in mind, we don't need a whole Egypt, uh, excuse me, uh, biblical mass exodus, you yeah. know, for, for ideas. You know, it could be a band of 10 people who bring with them a certain skill set and culture who settle down and create a school, you know, mm -hmm. and then this stuff diffuses. And so, like, this is what I mean by this this complex history, and we have to keep all of those as possibilities, and as good yeah. researchers and scientists, we have to go by each one of them and try to falsify them so that we can narrow down the truth depending upon the nature of our research question. So, yeah, so that's the kind of thing that I, I do. So what I'm arguing in this case with the things that you showed, that it's not, again, a whole bunch of ancient Egyptians who came and um, uh, uh, settled and tried to recreate ancient Egypt there. You probably had a band, you know, a small band of metallurgists who came out of the Marotic Sudan into, you know, um, um, what the, was the Nok civilization, which ultimately became the Yoruba, and, um, and, and created a craft there. And so the dominant language in that area is going to be Yoruba. And so, you know, there's no indication that, well, I take that back. There is some indication that a lot of the words in, in the Yoruba language are in fact 
the result of of migrations because there's certain evolutionary processes that happen along the now that did not happen in west africa but the the evolutionary doublets are in the the yoruba language so we're seeing loans we, we have evidence alone so this is something that i've been been kind of working on silently in in terms of yoruba specifically um in, in trying to explain these doublets and so when i'm looking at you know that type of evidence in comparison with some other things it is all starting to make sense so you're seeing these these small migrations of individuals who are settling in these different parts but it's not a mass exodus so to speak and we have evidence of that matter of fact this is what dr chancellor williams was talking about in instruction of black civilization that due to droughts due to war tootsie fly you know um volcanic eruptions and things it causes people to spread but not necessarily in mass you have families and villages that um that could be up to 30 to 100 people who will settle in an area but you also got to keep in mind that they may settle in an area and adopt the culture of the the native folks who were there without keeping their their individual identities and this happens all the time in 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 just the world in general but especially in africa yeah agreed. Mm -hmm. um i want to y'all having biblical discussions in the chat i see uh but i want to hold on there was somebody who made a contribution i want to thank um tigway evans um thank you for your contribution and thank you to uh mr trey day uh and you know uh in, you know contributions they guarantee that your 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 comments or questions will get answered and so um, Trader says some scholars like C. Williams have argued that an initial migration from Kemet into Nubia and then from Nubia, a diffusion into West Africa vis the Sahel. The Akan have this tradition. Um, it's just a general comment, I guess, not a, necessarily a, a, a question, yeah. but mm -hmm. I've come across that as well. Um, you you have several books. I'm just going to name. So, you know, many of us may know you with from the when we ruled but you also have a text understanding the book of the dead the equinox and the real story behind easter um the mysterious sciences of the great pyramid intellectual life and legacy of timbuktu uh african uh, american contributions to science and technology also black and economic empowerment uh, create your own plan to build great wealth, the musical tradition, oh, excuse me, the black musical tradition. Um, if you want to learn early African history, start here and the rise and fall of Black Wall Street. So I, hopefully um, I, I've named them all and you you may have others that, I, that I've missed, but I, I want to get everyone to understand that he has an array of texts uh ranging in the different subjects so you know let's start with the 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 technology text and and then we'll go into the economic empowerment text so you know those that are dealing with science and technology you know mention them and what are the kinds of things that they will learn uh in in those texts again what i do is i put it together I I simplify, I make it accessible. So, um, Van Sertima did the book Blacks in Science um, in 1983. Uh, Dr. Finch did uh, The Star of Deep Beginnings. My colleague, uh, another colleague from the Femi Biko days, uh, Ben Ali Benatari, did a paper, which he never published, but he should have done, called The Document of African Civilization. And what these books did was to tell an African science history. So my job was put it together. So my volume one, I did Blacks and Science volume one, and that deals with ancient Egyptian science and technology. And it deals with the mysterious sciences of the Great Pyramid. So the kind of things are ancient Egyptian contributions to mathematics, ancient Egyptian contributions to 
our metallurgy, our astronomy, our, our uh, uh, architecture, and then there's a whole section of the the, 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 the the stuff to do with the Great Pyramid, you know, is pi built into its structure, is, you know, B built into its, you know, structure, and so on, so on, and so forth. So that was the volume one. The volume two was to deal with ancient West Africa and ancient East Africa. So West Africa, you've got places like Timbuktu. Uh, what did they contribute to um, scientific and technological endeavor? So one of the things the West Africans contributed was they were among the inventors of, before there was a smallpox vaccine, there was a technology called inoculation, and that's the precursor to vaccines. And West Africans were doing that. In fact, one of the reasons why West Africa was targeted so heavily during the slave trade was because uh, black people had uh, uh, immunity to smallpox, and that was because uh, smallpox inoculation was so general in West Africa. It wasn't just West Africa, East Africans had it too. And it was an African-American gentleman who was enslaved called Onzimus, who popularized some of the West African techniques um, in Boston in the 1700s. Um, and that's how Europeans found out that there was technologies in how you can protect a population from smallpox. Um, and then there's East African science and technology. Um, again, that's one volume. And then the final volume was African-American contributions. Um, any African-Americans listening to this, you'll know about the great inventors, your um, Lewis Howard Latimer's, your um, uh, Granville T. Woods, that kind of material. And the idea was to put all that together, together with also the black people that contributed to things like the space effort, you know, your Christine Darden's, your Robert Shirney's, your um, um, uh, George Carruthers, those kinds of people, again, putting all that together into one book. Hmm. Oh, there's another STEM book that I did as well called African Mathematics. Okay. And what that does is to put together what we know about the ancient African uh, history of mathematics, the, the various Egyptian papyri, the Ishango bone, the Libombo bone, that kind of thing, some of the Timbuktu manuscripts, um, so that we, again, have an African mathematics history. Indeed. And um, just post a comment here and say uh, from Jaha H, people travel back and forth, creating a trader's language to bridge the gap between different languages. This happens whether people travel to resettle or just for trade. Indeed, that is something that um, I discussed in my 2016 text, Nesu Biti, King and Ancient Egyptian that um that indeed happens and so there's a we got to understand the possibilities and to see if there's evidence to support any of the possibilities to get a holistic uh picture of you know african history or just history in general um there was a question directly to you let me see brother conan um with regards to text and study which books are no longer valid for instance, much of Massey's work is now considered to be outdated. Please comment. Yeah, let me answer that. Um, I'm not a fan of Gerald Massey. Uh, <laughs> a lot of black scholars love Massey. And for example, one of my tutors, uh, Ray Bowen, a devotee of Massey, Charles Finch, as you know, is a devotee of Massey. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I have a problem with Massey is because far from bigging up black history, in my opinion, Massey shrinks it. And I'll tell you why. Hmm. Massey has the idea that if we want to look for what the ancient Egyptians were doing, look to what Africans south of the Sahara were doing. And that implies that Africans south of the Sahara have frozen in cultural time. So whatever hmm. the Africans south of the Sahara were doing, they were doing what they've been doing forever, and it's stuck in a pre-ancient Egyptian time. And so the idea then that West Africans in medieval times were writing checks, which is true, they were writing checks. You wouldn't, you couldn't get that from Massey. The fact that the Yorubas were making glass, you would never have got that from Massey. 
the mm -hmm. fact that one of the Songhai cities of Gao had glass windows, you would never have got that from Massey. The fact that um, the Timbuktu manuscripts um, predate some of the calculations of Galileo and Copernicus, you would never have got that from Massey. So I respect, you know, give respect to where respect is due. Massey made a huge contribution. Make no mistake, no Massey, a lot of black scholarship wouldn't exist. So I have to big up Massey and I have to big up what he contributed, especially to black people's contribution to religion. Where I have problems with it is where he presents sub-Saharan Africa as frozen in pre-Egyptian time. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, with Massey, pull sense where you can pull sense. I don't believe there's any such thing as an outdated text, personally. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You can always pull something from someone's work. Yeah. So, um, you know, so if, if, if Massey is something that you feel you can pull information from, grab it, you know. Indeed. And, you know, uh, I like the, the phraseology that you use in terms of um, Africans being frozen in time. Now, you know, we, we can say that certain languages and cultures are more conservative, yeah, yeah. meaning, you know, that they hold on for very long periods of time, you know, certain ancient traditions and, and certain languages like like Kikongo and Chiluwa are, are conservative Bantu languages, yeah. you know, um, and but that's not to say that they don't have their own innovations uh, respective, you know, in those languages. So that's something that we got to keep in mind. So there's a difference between being frozen, per se, and being conservative. Um, and, you know, the ancient Egyptians were conservative, but they they innovated you know, depending on the time period, you know, certain religious acts, certain ter certain types of technologies and things of that nature. So, you know, 3000 plus years of history, you know, of pharaonic history, at least you see the consistencies because they have a, a certain conservative mindset. But you'll notice that they no longer do this and they, yeah. you know, invented this at this particular time period, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's something that we got to keep in mind. So speaking on some of those West African, um, you know, native inventions and, and technologies and processes, you know, we have the the question from e Emmanuel Adama. Um, could you ask Mr. Walker to comment on indigenous African populations west of Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco and Algeria? Do you have, you know, what, what's your knowledge? Some some takeaways, I, I guess, from their histories. What 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 kinds of things should we be looking for? Um, the very first North Africans uh, were known as the Berbers, and the Berbers were originally black. Um, I know that there's white Berbers now, and there's Berbers that are in between in terms of complexion, but the very first Berbers were black. Um, and you read the writings of people like Herodotus, and some of this appears in Hermstein stuff. The different um, uh, ethnic groups uh, in North Africa, the Garamantes are described as for the most part Ethiopian. The Moors are described by Cilius Italicus as, um, there's a phrase where he says, there was a particular population in North Africa who were not woolly haired like the Moors. Mm -hmm. Not woolly haired like the Moors. So your original North Africans were, were black Africans. Um, and where they fit into history, there's a civilization called Carthage, which is on the North African coast of where Tunisia is today. Um, the Carthaginians were a mixture of three populations. You had Phoenicians coming in from the Middle East, who would appear to have been black. You had uh, Nile Valley Africans from Kush and Egypt, who were obviously black. And you had the indigenous Libyans who were there. And if you've seen the coins of the most famous Libyan of them all, um, Hannibal of the House of Barker. Um, in fact, not even coin coins of Hannibal of the House of Barker. The face couldn't be any more African. So there's an African history there. Then next door, you've got Numidia, and there's an African history there. Um, what else have we got? As far as Morocco, there's a, you know, an indigenous history there too. So what it is then is the different um, 
Libyan ethnic groups. The most detailed account of them, you know, descriptions of them. Um, let me recommend uh, uh, Hermstein's book. Um, he's written something called the, the Black Suma, the Physical Evidence, where he deals with the, the indigenous North African population. Indeed. I have a, a, a question from Facebook and I can't pull it up here, but I'll read it. Um, this is coming from uh, Kwasi Kim Ma Amponsa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, this person is asking, should we give credence to Mansa Musa as an African hero or an Islamicized exploiter of Africa? In, in your opinion, how do you view Mansa Musa? In, um, in that no, that's a good question. My tutor, uh, Dr. Femi Biko, was very critical of Mansa Musa and blames Mansa Musa's extravagance for drawing attention to West Africa that didn't mm -hmm. need to be drawn attention to, and almost blames Mansa Musa for bringing the slave trade against West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Yusef Ben Yokanan also holds that view. Me personally, um, I don't give away black Islamic history. You know, some people have this idea that if a black person's a Muslim, then they're not black no more. <laughs> and they give that history away. I don't do that. I claim black Islamic history because as far as I'm concerned, some of our ancestors were Muslims, deal with it. You know, that's the reality. Some of our people, you know, were at, in Timbuktu, uh, you see. So my thing very, very much is, um, if it's if it's black history, I'm bigging it up. I don't care whether those people were Muslims. I don't care whether they were Christians. I'm bigging it up straight. Hmm. Someone's written here. People in Mali hate Mansa Musa still today. Let me address that. Um, I am a, a member of uh, an African Union body, and because of that link, one of the professors in Mali invited me to Mali. And so I was in Mali a couple of years ago as a guest of, you know, the, 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 this professor. And his name was Adama Samaseku. So big up to Adama Samaseku if you're listening. And I met some of the, the Malian intellectuals, uh, Ali Sidi, who was a mayor of uh, Timbuktu, who is an Islamic scholar. And he was the one that showed Henry Louis Gates around the Sankore University Mosque and showed him the manuscripts and all the rest of it. The feeling I got in Mali is the Malians big up their history. <laughs> they really do. And they big up Mansa Musa. Now, you're going to have some people taking the view that Mansa Musa um, uh, was extravagance was a problem. But my view is whatever, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm quite happy for Mansa Musa to be in the lineage of black history. And we, we need to give it the proper respect. Richest human in the whole of recorded history with uh, an estimated wealth at the time of when it was estimated of 400 uh, billion US dollars. And therefore, for any businessman today, for any um, entrepreneur today, Mansa Musa sets the bar. Hmm. Indeed, indeed. Um, and, and so, you know, what people got to understand is that, you know, you you look at all of the history you don't have to agree necessarily with the lifestyle and methods of certain people in history one of the reasons that you study history is so that you can learn from it so if if you become a person of wealth and a leader in your country you know don't advertise your wealth to everybody like have a a, a wakanda you know type of attitude where you know we we keep our secret secret because it invites the the hatred of the world and and now you would have an example of that in Mansa Musa and you know we can also look at this from an agency standpoint in terms of Mansa Musa so with him being Muslim you know his his loyalties were to Islam and thus external of you know his native homeland and his people 
And so, you know, what happens when you don't have an orientation uh, that is grounded in your indigenous, you know, perspectives and worldview and what kind of effect can that have, you know, on your population? And so I think that's a question that can be asked. I'm sorry. Let me me answer that. Let me answer that. Uh, Chancellor, not Chancellor Williams, uh, Diop answers this. And he says, why is that double standard only thrown at Africa? Let me Mm. give you an example. Christianity evolved in the same Middle Eastern zone that Islam did. And therefore, Christianity is just as foreign to Europe as Islam is foreign to Africa. So if we are going to um, look at the Grand Mosque of Jene and say, but that's not an African building, it's dedicated to Islam, why don't we make the same argument about St. Paul's Cathedral in London? Well, that's to a Middle Eastern deity, do you see? Mm-hmm. So what it is then is black people are being asked to, to, to throw away their Islamic history as an alien colonization, but Europeans are not asked to throw away their Christian history. Christianity didn't, Christianity didn't start in Europe. None of the prophets in the Bible were Europeans. Do you see? Mm-hmm. And so there's that double standard. And I agree with Diop on this one. We have to defend our heritage against that double standard. If you were to take away Christianity from Europe, all they've got is Greece and Rome, and that's it. Indeed. And that, but I think it's a little bit deeper than simply abandoning the history. It's more so like for for us in the in the temple school, we'll say that, you know, Temple University in Philadelphia mm-hmm. uh, uh, of Afrocentric, you know, uh, research methodology. The the question that they would ask or we would ask is you know, to what degree did the people abandon their culture and the values of their culture for uh, someone else's? And and so, like, when it comes to Islam, Islam requires you as, as, as part of the doctrine to abandon your ancestors and the ideologies and things of that nature. To, let, to, let me answer that. Let me answer that. Yeah, let me answer that. Right. Um, I, I did a book with some of my colleagues. We did a book called everyday life in an early West African empire. I know a lot of people have asked me for it. I'm trying to get it so it can be sold. But we we did that book and we did uh, the most detailed research on the Songhai empire of West Africa, as far as we know there is. And one of the things is, is the religion of Songhai wasn't Islam as most people know it. It was Sufi Islam. And what what happened was, is that the, the West Africans from Songhai, how you would pray is you would pray through your ancestors. And those ancestors, there would be a whole city. So if you take the city of Timbuktu, for example, mm-hmm. they call mm-hmm. Timbuktu the city of 333 saints. I don't know if you know that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what you have is uh, uh, you've got the city, and then you've got around it the tombs of the 333 saints. Now, one of the um, medieval documents that allows us to reconstruct the history of West Africa is a book called the Tariq El Fatash, which is uh, a book by uh, a Timbuktu professor called Mahmoud Kati. And it's one of the books that Chancellor Williams used, uh, blah, blah, blah. When you're reconstructing the history, and there's there's a section in it where he's describing the different saints of Timbuktu. And if you've got this particular ailment, you will pray at this particular saint too, and you'll ask for blessings from that saint, or there'll be a particular saint. You see, now a lot of people don't realize that that is how West Africans used to do Islam back in the day. You have to pray to those saints. And similarly, in, in, in Timbuktu, the three great monuments, you've got the, 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 the university, the Sankore Mosque, you've got the Great Mosque, and you've got another building called the Oratory of Sidi Yahya. Sidi Yahya is one of those saints, you see. Mm-hmm. So he's immortalized. That's the reason why in the last um, eight years, since the Islamists, or mostly um, Pakistanis and Yemenis, are trying to blow up the shrines of Timbuktu. They're trying to blow up the shrines of the 33, 333 saints, you see. Indeed. and and how should I say, that is, 
I mean, because that's just African people in general. And this is this is a conversation that we have quite frequently mm-hmm. to where um, what the indigenous commonality in, in Africa in terms of their approach to knowledge is that, you know, I'll use a, a Ba'iru proverb to make the point. And that is a child who has never left home says my mother is the best cook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that that saying is, is, is that, you know, knowledge is, is external. Like you have a, you know, something that is homegrown, but we understand that there's more knowledge out there and we need to travel. We need to eat of other dishes. And so you know, I just recently wrote uh, an updated article for um, this this community journal called Killmonger's Corner, um, created by our good brother um, Benjamin Jaye, brother Black Panther. You know, of the Mosi Warrior Clan, which you can uh, find on the uh, the internet, and they have you know different lessons for people to 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 check out, but. One of the things that I stress and, and I provide, you know, um, primary commentary from um, people who have actually traveled this uh, thing called the, the, the African Superhighway of Wisdom. And what you learn is that, you know, just as you would have trade of, you know, items, just random, you know, things like that, that people would trade. But that there was also trade in terms of intellect and Africans would travel long distance to find these indigenous education systems and be initiated them, stay with them, you know, for a number of years before coming back and going somewhere else. And so this is this partially explains how certain similarities exist in just very long distance um, uh, areas or whatnot. But saying all that to say that this notion that you know, you can't learn from other people and, and adopt and integrate, you know, other, you know, other African or other people in general's, you know, religion and ideology and, and technologies. But that, that's not an African thing. They absorb, you know, what is useful to them and they integrate it in their own system. So it's not surprising, you know, what you're saying there as far as uh, Islam is concerned. But what we're talking about is the actual doctrine of Islam itself. So whether they understand it and, you know, certain people accept it or not is is secondary to the fact that the the doctrine of Islam itself requires them to abandon. And so when certain of our uh, African brothers and sisters in the past have realized that they turn their back on their ancestors and try to require you know the the current and future generations to adopt wholeheartedly the quote-unquote pure islam and that's that's kind of the 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 underlying issue which people are debating in terms of adopting so why adopt something let me jump in there to Uh, to abandon your 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 history i get that but you and i both know that the most important black scholar of the 20th century was a muslim sheikh Mm-hmm. How do we explain that? Yes, and married to a white person. And there's many different contradictions that, you know, uh, could come of that. But one of the things that we don't get from Diop is this notion that we should abandon our African culture for Islam. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's Muslim by circumstance. He was born into that. And so... Oh, that's the thing. He's a sheikh. Yes. So, you know... Uh, that's that's what he grew up in, and you know he comes from an, an educated family along those lines, and so you know it, it's not so much necessarily what Africans did, it's what should we do now, and it is Islam, for example, just because we're talking about it, is Islam or you know Christianity or Hebrew Israelisms, you know. Um, is that something that we should adopt today? And how does that affect our, in terms of adopting the ideology, how does that affect let, let our behavior in, in terms of our relations, you know, internally with each other? And so those are the larger questions that, 
you know, for example, an, an, an African centered scholar would ask. But go no, ahead. No, let, me that. let me answer that. Um, as you know, I'm a black studies um, tutor, mm -hmm. um, and religion is one of the important topics. And the result is, is as, as you already know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, mm -hmm. We have a history in all of those religions. Um, and my thing is, provided you know what that history and heritage is, you can make whatever religion um, um, yours to a certain extent, rather than be controlled by it. If you look at, for example, what Europeans have done with Christianity, they did not start Christianity. They, they were late comers to the party, but what they then did was take it over and make it there. And what I'm saying is, is you can't write the history of Judaism without black people in the story. The oldest synagogue in the world is on Elephantine Island. You can't write the history of Christianity without the history of black people in it. The first monks in the world, St. Pacomius and St. Anthony, were black indigenous Egyptians. You can't write the history of Islam without black people in that story. The first Mu'athin in Islam is a black man. Um, and as much as people don't want to hear it, he should have been the successor to the prophet. And you can read that in the, the, the farewell sermon where the prophet said that. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is we too quick to give away our history and heritage. And my thing is, I do understand and respect the debate about cultural purity. I believe me, I get it, I respect it. But we too quick to give away our history, um, where other people, if they had that art history, they wouldn't be giving it away. They'd be claiming it. I think there's a difference between claiming the history and being able to critique, critique the merits and the usability of a particular system, whether it's foreign or internal. So it, it's not simply that because it's external, and that's the point I was getting at, Africans have no problem adopting external concepts and ideas and ideology. That's part of the African milieu. The, the question is, you know, the, the way in which we adopt certain things and certain values. So for example, we know in the biblical tradition that allegedly um, after Moses comes out of and the Israelites come out of Egypt for allegedly being slaves, that, you know, they're, they're to be given this promised land. Yeah. Unfortunately, this promised land has people already in it True who thing. weren't the enemies of the Israelites. They have no interactions. Because yeah. remember that the Israelites came in as a small family and then left as, you know, 400 years later, you know, several hundred thousand. Yeah. So, you know, so they don't have a history and in interaction with these people. They're not their enemies. Yeah. So according to the text, you know, God commands them to invade and slaughter and destroy those people and to take over the land. So the question is, in this instance, do we adopt the value system that that argues that this is something that is accessible because when some other group comes to the conclusion that you know what well, god told us that we can have your timbuktu and your your uh uh ile ife and etc cetera, etc cetera, because god promised this to us so y'all got to move and die in order for me to settle there Interesting. you know we shouldn't be able to accept and so with what in, in an instance like this, like these types of things are part of the structure of the value system that makes up the whole religion. And so this is what causes the, the conflict. So it's not simply an issue of, of course, we know that, you know, due to historical events that black people have adopted and or contributed to the development of these religious systems. However, there are certain aspects of these systems that are counter the value systems that are indigenous in these certain spots. So should we adopt those when they are counter to, you know, our homegrown value system? So that's that's simply more so the question. It's not whether we should forget about the history, 
in essence, you know, and, and just throw it to the wayside. But what lessons can we learn from that and moving forward and, and how we should interact and deal with folks who hold that type of value system? So, you know, those are the kinds of things that uh, we got to keep in mind. Questions. Yeah. Um, we have this person been waiting on this uh, to ask this question for a long time. Um, Yashua Libyan now asks, do you have, talking to you, Mr. Walker, do you have any information on the pre-dynastic Libu or Ribu Libyans being the original pre-dynastic Egyptians before the Narma unification? Um, to my knowledge, uh, Wayne Chandler is of that opinion. Wayne Chandler makes it look like you've got an upper Egyptian uh, uh, um, population um, that's, if you like, black, southern, and indigenous, and you have a lower Egyptian population mixed with the Libyans. Um, Wayne Chandler may be right. But a lot of that is we really don't know because, you know, documenting that becomes very, very hard. Now, I did follow up on Chancellor Williams and look at um, some of the texts that Chancellor Williams uh, referenced, people like Sir Flinders Petrie. And Sir Flinders Petrie does have images of some of the early Libyans. And as far as I could tell, they were black. You know, they certainly had woolly hair, um, you know. now. Another connection between Egypt and Libya is a mummy was discovered at a site called Juan Muhujiaj. And that mummy uh, was an infant uh, that was mummified using a very, very advanced technique. And according to white Egyptologists, uh, Professor Joanne Fletcher, the technique used by these indigenous Libyans are the same ones that reappear. When, mum when mummification appears in ancient Egypt. Um, the same documentary, there's a, there a documentary on the whole thing where they also found evidence of the, um, uh, the, the, the deity uh, 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 Anubis or Ampu. Um, they, found that, they also found the cow deity um, Hathor um, in the Libyan context. And so some people say that there is a direct link between early Libya and early Egypt. Um, my view is, my view is uh, whatever. It's one group of Africans or another group of Africans. It's all good. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, the the Libyan mummy, but you you went directly into it. Yeah. Um, someone asked, uh, or someone states, D H. Um, uh, I'm, I guess I'm currently reading When We Ruled with a study group south of London. What is the best way to learn the info as a group and teach the children? Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I came in late, but thank you both for your work. So, Yeah, um, I wouldn't recommend When We Rule for Children. I would recommend there's a, a, a school book that I wrote called 19 Lessons in Black History. Hmm. So I would recommend that. So there's a book called 19 Lessons in Black History, and it's laid out school style. So every double page is a lesson. And the first five lessons are dealing with African civilizations. The second five lessons are dealing with black contributions, African contributions to science and technology. Uh, then I deal with the transatlantic slave trade. And then the subsequent lessons are resistance to the transatlantic slave trade. So getting the whole uh, uh, story uh, from Africa to the diaspora in 19 lessons. So if I were you, I'd start there. Indeed, indeed. And um, I want to, you know, before we go, get uh, on your, your economic text, okay. you know, and well business. So you mentioned at the beginning of the program that you're not only a, a historian, a, a black studies person, but you are also a business person. And so I assume that, you know, from this experience and interest comes the motivation to, to write those books. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, those books and, and, and what's it about and what do you want us, or what do you intend for us to get as a result of reading those texts? 
Um, years ago, I saw a book in uh, a black bookshop called, um, there's a black bookshop in London called uh, Head Start. And the book I saw was a strange title, Black Folks Guide to Making Big Money in America. So I picked it up. I found out that the author was a black studies instructor called George Sabira. And I've since read uh, many of George Sabira's books about money and wealth. And the idea that there are principles to building wealth, um, that blew my mind. Now, I have a background in economics. Mm. And um, a lot of economics and business studies teaching in the mainstream is, is, is not useful. A lot of it is, is, is intellectual misdirection. When I read uh, George Sabira's work, it light bulbs went off and that kind of thing. So I've been studying entrepreneurship um, and wealth building uh, quite seriously since um, coming across George Sabira's work. And uh, it's one of the things I teach as an important part of black studies. So I believe that when you teach black studies, you've got to teach the history, you've got to teach the religion, the sociology, the psychology, the politics, black people's contributions to science and technology, but you also have to teach personal finance. And so um, I've since read some of the other people like Japanese American guru, Robert T. Kiyosaki, uh, people like Polish guru, uh, T. Harv Ecker. And what I've done is to synthesize these ideas into uh, personal finance, which I think is an important part of black studies. So I wrote a history book, um, excuse me, a history paper called The Rise and Fall of Black Wall Street. And then I combined that with my own ideas called The Seven Key Empowerment Principles. And so the complete book now is the first half is uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street. And the second half are the business principles that I think uh, black adults can learn uh, from that, from uh, uh, from that experience. Okay, um, quickly, uh, Mujiza Mujiza um, asked on Facebook, "Will you repeat the name of the book with the title 19 Points? Can you give us the full name again of, of that uh -huh. text?" It's called, I can't even remember the name to be honest. I think it's called <laughs> 19 Lessons in Black History. There's okay. more to the title than that, but if you get that bit, it will come up on Amazon. So you can find it on Amazon, 19 Lessons in Black History. I think it says something like for high school, key stage three, some, 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 but 19 Lessons in Black History. See, that's when you know you've written a lot of text, when you don't remember the full titles uh, of all your works. Uh, but I will ask uh, JCAC, JCAC double, <laughs> asks, what are your views on using sub-Saharan African, in quotes, uh, as a descriptive for Africans, black people? Many white genetic geneticists, I assume, and historical departments have been using sub-Saharan as a way to categorize us. Yeah, let me answer that. Uh, my tutor, Dr. Femi Biko, teaches that the term sub-Saharan African and Black African are insults. Mm -hmm. And he teaches that you don't qualify the majority. So if we're going to be using the terms, he proposes that Black scholars should consider referring to what white people call sub-Saharan Africa, referring to that as greater Africa, and referring to North Africa as Africa Minor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a discussion that black scholars need to have. And, and you know, even still, it's, it's uh, again, a, an issue of agency. Um, so why should we be dividing the continent in that manner in the first place? Like, what's the logic for saying, you know, sub-Saharan Africa as a category versus, you know, um, you know, uh, the northern part of Africa, we'll just say in general, North Africa. Um, and, and why does that assume any kind of genetic or racial, you know, difference 
um, et cetera. Like these are the kinds of questions that we have to, you know, uh, raise. You know, I know, you know, we've had Dr. Uh, Shoremarker Keita, you know, on the program and I work with him uh, closely and we're actually working on a book. Um, I'm editing, but it, it's, it's his work. Uh, a, a text kind of dealing with these with these particular issues and you know so he he likes to call it super saharan you know um and but he he's categorically against those um those those types of categorizations when when it comes to african people and so for those who don't or aren't familiar with him he's a biological anthropologist and a medical doctor you know who delves into uh, a, a lot of this, uh, especially now Valley, but African history in, in general, but from a genetic, you know, and bone perspective uh, uh, as well. So um, let me see. Uh, I think it's two more questions. So before I get to these two questions, I'm going to make an announcement. So Actually, I'm going to share my screen and we'll go to the Chrome tab and we're going to uh, go there and share that document. So let me see if it's shared correctly. So, yes. So this is the web page, um, the RBG Centennial Conference. So there's going to be an online conference a worldwide conference on August 8th and 9th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. And it is to celebrate the 100 years since that, you know, first, uh, you know, Pan-African Congress. It was an international Congress, uh, you know, headed by Marcus Garvey. So I think there's going to be like 80 speakers, you know, for the total of two days. There's going to be kind of main conference rooms and then some breakaway uh, conference sessions. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of laid out just like what you would see at a at a normal conference, a, a physical conference. Um, however, you know, of course, due to the the COVID-19 situation around the world, you know, traveling is just not safe. Uh, at this particular point in time. So they vouch to make it an online conference. So, you know, to get more details and to purchase tickets for the conference and to to note the featured speakers and et cetera, uh, go to RBG Central, oh, excuse me, not Central, RBGcentennial.com. Now I will be giving, I've already given away two tickets and I'll be giving away five more tickets, you know, from now going into, you know, August, uh, probably like a week before um, the the event goes down. So the way that you can win a, a ticket is to go to my homepage, which is at asarmhotep.com, and sign up for my newsletter. I kind of rarely send out newsletters, so I'm not the kind of spam because I myself don't like to be spam. But if you go to asarmhotep.com on the very homepage at the bottom, you will see a, you can just enter your name and email address and that will enter you to win. So, you know, I had a total of seven tickets. I've already given away two. And so if you want to get a chance to win a ticket to both days of the conference, then I would suggest that you sign up for the newsletter. And so I want to be able to keep in contact with you just in case I go full revolutionary on YouTube and they decide to take my YouTube channel down and all of that good stuff, but more so to keep you in contact uh, and let you know, you know, when we have uh, something major going on. So we have, you know, Baba Mulamu Baruti, Sister uh, Dr. Ama Mazama, Queen Mother uh, Masharika uh, Juwanza, uh, Brother uh, Dr. Obadeli Cambone, 
brother and sesh, Dr. Malefe Kitty Asante. Uh, I myself am also a participant in this conference. And so I will be discussing Marcus Garvey and the importance of science to African liberation. That's the title of my discussion. I believe I will be speaking on the 9th in one of the breakout sessions. So these, these tickets will uh, that I'm giving away will be for the main rooms, the main conference rooms. But I think if you want to purchase, I mean, if you want to view the breakout sessions, and I think there's going to be a total of five breakout sessions, you will have to pay for the breakout sessions. And I think it's just $15, you know, per day for the breakout sessions. But, you know, most of the main room stuff, all of that and the, the panel discussions for that, that will be free, you know, with the ticket that, you know, um, I will give the winners. So if you have not signed up for the, the, uh, um, the newsletter, I suggest that you all do that. So go to asarmhotep.com and you can, uh, win a chance to, uh, get a, or you can, you have the opportunity to win um, a, a ticket for the conference. So that's my, how should I say, uh, announcement for the day. <laughs> uh, and so, um, there were two more questions and I'll just ask these two questions and then, um, we will, you know, end the program. Um, let me go back up and see if I can catch it. Um, uh, let me see. So I'll go with Afro consciousness. There you well, see. Publish a Pan African Renaissance University that would advance the European system. Um. I can't answer that. Certainly, I've got my own education plans. Um, what about you, Azar? You planning to do something like this? Um, actually, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I know for um, a minute, Dr. Malefe Kitty Asante and Dr. Ama Mazama was working on creating an online university uh, that where you can get, you know, up to a PhD in Africology. And but um, for some reason, that kind of fell through. So I don't know if they're going to be reorganizing that um, as well. Now, we have Dr. Taka uh, and his wife, Ife Kilimanjaro, who are educators and have created the UKIMIT Press and have organized a number of, you know, over 20 something books on various aspects of African history, you know, creating research teams, learning how to do research, et cetera, et cetera. And I know they have plans on creating an online university called UKIMIT Press. Now, um, I'm going to be doing the same thing, but it's a bit more narrowed in terms of now Valley studies. And so you, I would consider it more so a college than a university. Um, but you know again my background is primarily in in software development and computer science and so you know i have those skills to kind of develop those things so i know it, it takes a a certain amount of money and technical know-how to at least do an online version of of that university but so i think with those you know all of us we're, we're looking at an online university type presence um but as far as a physical university you know, we would hope that that would be, you know, the next step. So if we if we can't get the, you know, like the physical building and representation and stuff like that, you know, the the online is a good first start to where you can kind of land and make a, a physical presence. Um, you know, so most universities now have an online, you know, like I'm currently in school online to, uh, for an advanced degree in computer science. So this. Uh, you know, this is the, the next step in trying to expand 
um, and and make a, a university system like that in a way that's feasible that you know anybody around the world can access and and attend. So um, it's it's as far as that con is concerned, uh, the the question is yes, but more so on a on a online university uh, an online presence. Um, and there was another question. Uh, let me see. I think that's it. On the question of the Libyans, please comment on the four races of the world. Why is it Libyan called, uh, I guess you meant Tamahu, and portrayed as ivory color in the mural? Let me answer that. Um, the four races, I think uh, the the person might be referring to the inside of Ramses the Third Temple. Is that what you think he's referring to? I think so. His his grave. Um. Yeah. All right. The <laughs> Ramses the Third thing. There's four images of an Egyptian, four images of a Libyan, four images of a, a Sudanese, and four images of Middle Eastern. And then black mm -hmm. scholars usually reproduce it as one of each. So you've got four different people. Mm -hmm. Those Libyans are almost certainly people from the coast. They're almost certainly not indigenous Libyans. The indigenous Libyans would have been black. Mm -hmm. I know this. Um, throughout Egyptian history, there are um, Libyans that end up as rulers. Some people think that the pharaohs of the 22nd and 23rd dynasties uh, were Libyans. And one of the queens from that period, um, I think her name is Hanatawi, has survived. And if you look at Hanatawi's mummy, that is clearly, unmistakably, a Negro woman. There is um, an image that I reproduce in the second edition of When We Ruled of the uh, 26th dynasty female ruler. Her name is Ankenes Neferabra. And that is, again, clearly a Negro woman. So what it is then, I think the white images um, on the Ramses III uh, monument, they are from Libya, so you could say they are Libyans, which is a bit mm -hmm. like saying, I'm from London, therefore I am a Londoner. <laughs> but what is a Londoner? I'm not an indigenous Londoner, do you see? Mm -hmm. And I think that those white images are not indigenous Libyans. Now, the idea that Tamahu means created ivory is, again, more Gerald Masseyism. Uh, <laughs> Massey was the person that said that. Um, that might refer to some of the people on the coast, but um, people more inland in Libya would have been black Africans like everybody else. Indeed, indeed. And um, it's interesting, there's some oral tradition because there's some Africans in Senegal called uh, Lebu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they they argue that they come from Libya. That, like, that's where they um, originate and migrated into West Africa. I haven't had time to research the merits of, of that claim, but, it, but at least, you know, coincidentally, the the names seem to match mm -hmm. and of course that's the the name uh rebu in the uh ancient egyptian language as they refer to uh some of the people in that area and this is kind of one of the things that we have to be cognizant of in terms of especially with ancient egyptian historians like they they tend to use one term and make a blanket categorization of a lot of people it's like using the term nubian the ancient egyptians didn't have a term nubian and they never referred to that area as nubia they 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 identified different ethnic groups or you know population centers you know in what we call modern day um nubia uh which is you know will be the uh the, the sedan today and you know, you kind of get that sense of like when they say Asiatics, there was no Asia then that, you know, uh, there's no such thing as the Asiatic. There was certain groups of, of, of people. And that's the, the name, the identifier, you know, of those those people. So it is the same thing with 
uh, certain people who they're calling Libyans, they have a specific ethnic group name. And, and if people really kind of identify and deal with it, you know, from the, the ethnic name of those individuals and make it easier to kind of isolate possibly who these people are even in modern times. But I think that's, you know, some of the laziness in the, in the scholarship of a lot of uh, the, the Egyptologists by blanketing saying Libyan, Asian, you know, in Nubian without, you know, giving recourse to the fact that the names that the, the Egyptians refer to them as. Um, and, and even when you look at the name uh, uh, Tamahu, it's really a reference of certain people who lived in the Delta. And um, and it has the word Mehu in it. Mehu is the word for the Delta. And so you got to kind of know the Egyptian grammar and and how like the, the Ch is a kind of a you know nominalizer uh in the language and so in some some of the words uh in references to people the ch um is prefix like in the case of the chamahu but in others it is suffix like in the word remetch and so you know this is why in coptic is is romi lomi etc but the because the, they lost that grammatical morphine the the ch on uh, that's used in the language and so in some words it's prefix in some words it's suffixes but these were people who foreigners who lived and settled in the delta and um so that's what they're saying so you know we got to be cognizant of uh, uh of these of these words that the actual egyptians used to identify them and in the history behind that versus the uh the kind of blanket categorizations that the, the Europeans do because they, you know, in many instances are just lazy when it comes to um, the, the scholarship. But um, with that said, this has been a very informative uh, conversation. And we have touched on an array of, of subject matter. And I encourage every one of you to to purchase, you know, one of the books uh, mentioned, um, especially, of course, the second edition of When We Ruled. But, you know, he has an array of 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 text and, you know, he has a, a, a wide range of, of expertise and, and studying. So he's a, a great teacher and um, I appreciate, you know, you again for coming on the program and engaging critically, you know, uh, with uh, my audience. So just like to thank you uh, uh, again for coming on. And so if they want to get in contact with you, if they want to learn more about, you know, what you're doing and things of that nature, do you have, you know, a website and a, and a social media presence where they can uh, kind of connect with you uh, personally? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. So look me up, Robin Walker, on Facebook. Uh, my avatar is When We Rule, so it's easily spottable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so check me out. And by the way, big thanks for inviting me onto the onto the, the, the discussion. It's been really, really good. Um, some good information got chopped up, so it's been a pleasure, seriously. Indeed, indeed. So, um, you know, just hold on a little bit, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll put you in the green room. But um, I will leave my contact information. And so for, and, and for everyone who is listening, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you're not a subscriber already, uh, hit the like button, share this uh, conversation, you know, with all your friends and colleagues and, and keep the conversation going. Of course, support our good brother, uh, purchase his text. And for those of you who are in London, are you still holding, you know, classes, um, you know, regular? Is that yeah. still a thing? Yeah, let, let me let me explain that. Okay. We start a Black Studies program, again, aimed at the adults. Um, we're doing it on Saturdays. We're going to be starting that in August, the end of August. Uh, in fact, let me give you the date. So we're going to be starting that on August the 29th, and then we're going to be running it for um, right up until February. So it's going to be every Saturday from August the 29th in Croydon. So if you want information, hit me up on Facebook. 
Um, and I can then send people the information. So it's going to be Croydon at the venue, Croydon Supplementary Education Project. And then I can give people further information. Indeed, indeed. And of course, if you want to uh, ask any questions or get in contact with me, I'm basically on all the major uh, social media platforms with the exception of TikTok. I just really don't see the purpose of TikTok, but maybe that's just because I'm getting older and my hairs are getting grayer. But uh, here's my contact information, and uh, we will see you next time. So y'all enjoy your day, and again, like, subscribe, and share uh, the video. Peace out.